Hey everyone, before I get into my interview with the director and producer of Namu, um, I just wanted to give a quick heads up. Um, the edits this week are, well, this, this interview I mean, um, are going to be a little hectic. Um, this was very early in the morning for me, so um, apologies. Um, if it seems like there's a bit of a weirdness with the edit this uh, for this interview. But uh, I promise um, that the next interview, um, I believe, is uh, Cherry Lemonade. Uh, and yeah, I'll be able to control that uh, more. And I'll, it's later today, you know, towards the end of the workday. So fingers crossed. All right, let's get to my interview. Hey everyone, my name is Austin Belzer from Austin B Media, and today I am interviewing the director of the short film Eric O and the producer of the short film Namu, uh, Kane Lee, uh, that had its online premiere on June 9th at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, Eric, Kane, do you guys want to introduce yourself, maybe where people know you from? Um, sure. So I'm Kane Lee. I'm the head of content at Baobab Studios. We're the six-time Emmy Award um, interactive animation studio based in San Francisco. Um, and I'm also very fortunate to have been one of the producers on Namu, um, which is our um, first project together with uh, Oscar nominated, recently Oscar nominated director Eric O, oh, who's um, been a longtime friend and collaborator. But this is a, this is kind of a dream project come true. And we are just absolutely thrilled to be having our New York premiere here at Tribeca Film Festival. Yes, um, hello everyone. My name is Eric O, the director writer of NAMU. Um, yeah, I'm a filmmaker based in Bay Area. And yeah, again, happy to be here in New York to share NAMU with people over here. So thank you. Yeah, and um, you said this is the first? Um for Baobab uh, Studios. Uh, and apologies if I massacre any pronunciation. Um, <laughs> no so problem. How's it been? Um, I'm, I, you're screening it physically, uh, right? Yes, well, we've been, we've been, we've been very fortunate to um, have partnered with Tribeca Film Festival um, to also have, um, you know, uh, in-person premiere events. Um, but this is our, you know, online um, um, uh, North American or world online premiere. So um, at the same time. Okay, the reason I asked, I, I know I checked in it said online premiere, um, but the reason I asked is I was actually, Eric, I was gonna ask you what uh, people, what you've been seeing uh, from people who have seen it so far. Their, their reaction, you mean? Yes. Um, so it's been a very emotional experience for all of us, you know, because after a year and a half of kind of like stream lockdown, it was literally our first time, first of all, seeing people in the eyes in person and then having, you know, being able to actually watch the film together in one physical space, that has been already kind of like overwhelming experience for me. But um, yeah, it was incredible. People were there were a lot of tears by the end of the, when the credit was rolling, but I was so happy that like everybody was resonating with the story we were trying to tell. It is a life story. It is about humanity. It is uh, about like questioning, you know, where we are from and where we go. So, um, yeah, I mean, people were, I don't know. I think people were having a great time, right, Kane? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the, um, my, one of my favorite aspects about the film is that it examines a life, but all the different emotions that are associated with life. So good and bad, you know, joy and sorrow, you know, um, you know, pain and fun and adventure and exploration and awe and wonder. So, you know, all the different things that um, we universally can relate to, um, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I think the balance of all that is something that people can relate to. And, and the feeling of time and you know the good parts and the bad parts of your life not being this sort of like linear um, uh, unfolding 
but actually like you feel time really stretched out and really squashed during these like important moments. Um, you know, and I, and I hope that the film um, conveys that. And I think from the response we've been getting, um, which is, you know, very, like Eric said, it's just, it's been very um, emotional for our team to see it because you can't, people can't ex hide their expressions. Um, you, you know, we could send it to them virtually and they can write us an, S, you know, an email about how they responded, but to actually see it on their faces, um, you know, it, it, it speaks um, a thousand words. So um, it's, been, it's been an emotional roller coaster ride for us on this trip. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, and it was kind of interesting because I went back to theaters, um, oh, for a press screening of the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Uh, don't recommend it. And I was just kind of, I found myself kind of watching faces for a little bit. And I was like, huh, <laughs> haven't had this in a while. Exactly. I mean, I had been going to see like, oh, what did I see? Like Spiral from the Book of Saw and... Um, New Mutants, uh, but like there wasn't that reaction, that um, raucous laughter. But anyways, <laughs> shifting gears back, uh, it, um, one of the things that is kind of interesting, so animation, I, I feel like tends to be kind of modern uh, animation kind of seems to be stuck in a box in some ways you know you've got like a doing stop motion there's not a real variety of um animated styles but mm -hmm. you eric um there's this art style kind of reminded me of the children's books you would read as a kid mm -hmm. the um forget the name like i forget what they're mm -hmm. called but like those ones with the golden spine on them it rem reminded me of that or like Good Night Moon. So did that c come from just like a sketch of something you just did once in an afternoon, like a painting or something like that? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a it's combination of, of everything. Of course, the core vision and the, like the overall direction of the aesthetics and style, you know, has been always there. Like as soon as I wrote this story as soon as I came up with this, okay, I want to create this whimsical, very hand, you know, traditional touch and, you know, um, feeling I love to convey that, you know, through the mm -hmm. art and look of the aesthetics. But then of course that it went through so many evolutions, you know, um, as soon as we bring it on more artists and, you know, and then we tried a variety of different versions of paintings and, and look exploration. And then finally we ended up like having what we got. And then I'm super happy and proud because we were using some, some of high-end technology to achieve this look, you know? So um, I can share briefly about technical, you know, approach of this. We, we are using the software called Quill. It is a v okay. VR software. We can animate, paint, and do everything creatively in virtual reality, real time. So we were using it and then that, with that, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, software, and then some of the uh, uh, um, post production we actually were able to do afterwards together, we were able to achieve this look. And I'm very happy with the look. And and thanks for recognizing it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and it's funny because I also watched something about animation earlier last week. Uh, Clay Dream. I you should check it out. By the way, it's really good. Okay. Cool. Uh, um, it's about uh, Will Vinton and. You know the guy who made California Raisins and annoyed all of it in the secret story. Anyways, um, actually interviewed him. Anyways, um, cool. I should have asked him about uh, the director about that, but um, because he also tries something interesting, mm. and um, so still digging into the art style. Um, it. This tree, the Namu, or, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, yeah, it is correct. Namu, okay. yeah. Okay. One of the questions I came away with, and maybe that's just because my brain works, is mm -hmm. this tree as maybe a representation of memories and life events. Is that just something that just came up? Oh, the tree of life, or 
something that just I don't know sparked um, during development of the film. I mean, the core idea of the inspiration really came from my personal experience. You know, um, yeah. um, like many many years ago. I mean, it's been a while, so the you know, uh, so basically the initial idea came up when I lost my grandfather um, almost like a, almost ten years ago, um, and then what's interesting was after he was gone within this grieving process, you know, and of course he's been always inspiration to me, you know, and then the whole life, he's the one who's been encouraging me to become an artist from the first place. So he's has been a huge influence in my life, but ever since it was gone, we, in a weird way, I felt like, oh, he's like closer to me than ever before, spiritually in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like a sense that he's still my guiding star, you know, my North whole you know for whole life and that literally became the core story of this idea like as, as you probably have watched the you know film yeah like so um and then but I wasn't able to put all the ideas about life together all in once at the time because first I was emotionally a little too overwhelmed to do that second of all maybe I wasn't wise enough to you know tell this you know um death life story so I put it in my mental drawer and and it's been sitting there and then, yeah, I was, you know, um, growing up, learning more aspects about life, which is, as I, as Kane also shared, life is all about ups and downs, happiness and joy and sadness all together, right? And there's a farewells and there's a good, like, new life coming in. So, and then, yeah, with all those ideas about life, you know, slowly it just kind of got formulated. So, yeah, that's how I got to create this story. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you talk about um, spiritual closeness um, mm -hmm. after somebody's gone because I'll be writing a review and I'll think about, oh, um, would my dad have liked this? Mm. Would he? Because he he's what got me into movies. Without the blockbuster trips and um, and all that. I mean, I saw Juno when I was not. Not uh, not uh, thirteen yet. Sure. Um, um, I don't think I would be doing this. Um, finding uh, just the small movies and talking to people about it. That that's why I do this. And it's just I'll I'll take a seat back actually in this seat and um, be like you know. Would somebody, if somebody saw this on a shelf, if, if I saw this on a shelf in Blockbuster, if my dad saw this on a shelf in Blockbuster, what would they want to know and why? And what inspires from this project? It from, you know, like glad, glad yesterday I reviewed the movie Censor, a uh, horror film about the 1980s video nasties era in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I just had to sit back and be like, okay, here's what I do. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I totally get that spiritual thing you're talking about. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it is, you know, there's that time, you know, that, that sort of like um, timelessness of it, but then there's also, it is very much a product of where we are in the world right now. Um, I mean, our, our team around the world in nine different time zones, <laughs> um, because you know, <laughs> um, a little bit before the pandemic, we actually wanted to recruit the best artists because we were using this very specific, innovative you know, tool that is it's, you know, very technologically advanced, but every single frame you see in this film is hand-painted, every single frame. Um, hmm. So while we were using the latest technology, we were actually using like the you know the most time honored techniques in animation of making sure every you see every brush stroke. So we had to go oh. for the eight team. We decided to do that, and then the pandemic happened, and it was weird because it was like we had already created like a system or a pipeline that was um, was made for it. But I think on a creative level, I think we were all just very inspired by Eric's vision, and our studio Beovab just really embraced it because like the story is about kind of taking a step back during these key moments and reflecting on your life 
and thinking about your life's meaning and the choices you've made that have created your tree of life. Anyone's, and everyone has a different tree of life. Things branch out, different objects, different memories, you know? <clears throat> and at the same time, we're at this weird point, all of us um, in human history, where like all of us are looking at mortality in a new way um, across the world. And so it wasn't lost on our crew and, and you know, in developing this with Eric that um, we're creating this animated poem come to life. And there was this sort of weird and unexpected poetry about us doing that in the middle of um, this very moment. And it was, so it is, I think we were going for something timeless, but, it, it is, but at the same time, it is really a reflection of what the world has gone through in the past year as well. Yeah, it's, that's actually perfect um, because there's a representation of almost like a, t well, pun intended, I guess, ticking clock uh, within the film. There's a scene yeah. with the grandfather of all the tree of clocks at one point. Yeah. And um, there's one point where he, um, where he has to choose between this ivy or the tree of life. And almost like it, it, that was cool. Um, mm -hmm. Well, not cool, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And it's this, I, I think the highlight of this film about is about that balance of, hey, we've got a limited time. Mm -hmm. So why are we working behind a desk when there's the, the stuff on this tree behind us um, that is so much more than those clocks. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's something I think a lot of people are thinking of now, uh, as you say, Kane, um, because in fact, I had a discussion with it about it last night with another reviewer um, about this sense of jobs being like, if, if it's not fun anymore, it's a job. And sometimes that's not fun. And Eric, I felt the breath of life you breathed into this film. And I think I've got time for one more question uh, because I've been kind of babbling on about what I like about this film. Uh, apologies Thank for you. that. No, no um, worries. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know this was painted in VR. Well, not <laughs> painted in VR, but translated into a VR space. I guess my question is, how does that even work? Uh, <laughs> that is so beyond my comprehension of being, I don't even know how you begin with that. Kane, do you think you want to really simplify the explanation and easy, cheesy way sure. of Sure, just in, 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 layman, in layman's terms. Buddy, like, think looks, about sorry, Kane, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It looks like I, for some reason, this is an unlimited Zoom account, but we only have two minutes and I don't want to cut you both off. I changed the setting so it'll uh, be uh, as much time as we want next time if we just want to quickly rejoin. Uh, that same, oh, okay. um, and that way we'll have unlimited amount of time. Um, I'm so sorry, I, I, I accidentally. No worries. Yeah. No worries. So I'll just rejoin really quickly, um, and then same we'll, link. Yes, same link one more time. So sorry. We'll see you guys in a sec. Okay, you right. want one second? Okay. So. All right. Yeah. One final question. Um, to restate. Um, how did you translate all, the, I, I didn't know you translated paintings to a VR space. So this is again, beyond my level of comprehension at, at some point. So how did you do that? Sure, I mean, so one of our partners um, on the film is Oculus and they have this okay. amazing uh, tool, real-time animation tool called Quill, and in, to put it the most in the most simple way possible, um, you know, our animators um, put on a VR headset, and now they're in a completely 360-degree immersive space, 
and they can hand sculpt and hand paint these objects and items that are um, uh, part of our film. And we use that creating the paintings in a 3D space as what you ultimately see on the screen. So it's just another way to paint, but it's like you're, you're, you're like, you know, in a walk space and you can um, uh, um, walk 360 degrees around the different objects that you paint. And um, in a way it actually, it, it shows um, each brush stroke. It shows all the like slight imperfections in, in terms of how you do it. It makes, uh, to go to your earlier point, there's a sameness in animation that kind of permeates in the CG animation industry where everything is trying to look so photo real and trying to look the same and um, you know, while, while we are huge fans of that, I mean, none of us would be in animation without that. Right. Um, there's room to explore and to grow. And so, um, you know, Baobab, you know, our chief creative officer is Eric Darnell, who directed DreamWorks' first, very first film ever, Ants, um, and then all four Madagascar oh, films. He started out as an experimental animation at CalArts. He did REM's first um, music video, which is an experimental animation video. Um, and so when he sees filmmakers like Eric O, oh, who are, you know, this, the new generation of pioneers really pushing um, the limits, that, that is what's exciting to Baobab. We don't have a house style. We want to push um, the animation industry in exciting ways and, and be bold and daring. Um, and so if it's about, you know, hiring um, and bringing, recruiting the best crew from around the world, no matter what country they are in, um, and God bless our production manager in nine different time zones um, and working at all hours of nights in VR headsets to paint something which then translates into a theatrical 2D short film. We're going to try it, you know, and, you know, we'll, 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 we've made plenty of mistakes along the way, but like, I think our attitude um, as trying to be like a new studio for the 21st century that is not limited by national borders or even you know what are the techniques we can use um you know we just we really want to um uh push it um uh, and inspire um storytelling that can really um you know communicate these emotions these really strong emotions that um and this very personal story that eric brought into the piece so i i guess i lied I guess I have one more question that actually came from your answer to the question, Kane. Um, so with, um, you talk about d diversity in animation um, and at least styles, I mean, um, well, I guess both um, because you do talk about uh, different countries um, and uh, what Eric I guess this would be for you um, what would be your advice for animators starting out mm. well I have a ton of advice of course yeah <laughs> but I, I can but there's one really important thing you know um, you know what, what kind of artists you want you like to be, you know, first of all, it should really start from, you know, your personal space, what kind of story you like to tell, the mes message you like to convey, you know, through your art. Of course, you know, the the artistry and draftsmanship, the skill, it is important. Yeah, you got to keep, you know, financing your your skill set to achieve certain, like, you know, um, just to really master at a, at a uh, uh, the, you know, to reach a certain level in terms of the quality, right? But even before that, like, you know, through those, what do you like to tell? What do you like to, you know, you know, what's your voice? What's your vision? So um, I think everything should start from there, you know, then you'll know what your next step is, you know, and then and then you won't be able to be swept away by all these challenges and obstacles that will come at to you, you know, constantly, you know, and then, you know, but with those clear visions in your mind, you'll be able to constantly pursue what you believe in. So, yeah, I mean, that's my really small, humble advice to the <laughs> aspiring artist, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I would, I, it, I'm not an animator, but I would have to say, well, like, watch everything. 
watch all oh, yeah. different styles. Like, mm-hmm. um, I forget the studio, and I, I don't like that. I uh, don't know it. But the studio behind the Chicken Run movies, uh, well, not movies, but... Um, Ardman? Ardman. Ardman. Uh, yeah. And then watch stuff from Leica. So just, I, I think my advice would be watch all different yeah. type of styles so you know, hey... It's not just these two boxes you can go in because I look at Luca, which is coming out in two days. And I'm like, it looks like an Aardman film, but without the character of an Aardman (laughs) film, if that makes sense. Like, I think I tweeted uh, once when I, when we got that first bill that, uh, uh, Pixar stole Ardman's whole art style or something like that. I, I forget the tweet, but anyways. Um, so yeah, um, just thank you both so much for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. And I love the film, uh, short film. Uh, and uh, yeah, I I really want people to check this one out. I think... I, I think short films kind of get, pun intended, uh, the short stick at festivals. But the reason I talk to so many short film directors and all that is because there's a lot more to talk about, actually, than in a feature film. Um, there's much more artistry going into it. Like, this is a 12-minute short. It tells me more in 12 minutes than a two-hour movie sometimes. Thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, but my review of uh, Namu will be up in the next couple of days. Um, been a busy time, as I'm sure Eric Kane, you can attest to. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, thank you so guys. We really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Yeah. no problem. Thank Uh, you so much, Austin.